that I know I had when I was younger, uh, was very much a background person. Um, you know, I couldn't even imagine her doing housework and all that sort of thing. And so, although I knew she was very important in terms of uh, our whole church tradition, it, it, she never really struck me somehow as being the kind of model that at that point in my life I was looking for, I suppose. Um, so I guess I myself discounted her importance and influence. And I suspect that maybe happens quite a lot um, these, these, you know, maybe for the past century. And so although our church pays a lot of attention to Mary and, and should, this, the direct influence I, I find wasn't really there. Even when I started doing theology, studying theology, it was, it was as if Mary, she was a background figure, what she wasn't prominent. Um, as a matter of fact, I was just thinking, I've listened to several several homilies, being able to go to mass, the virtual mass, that you're, you were at mass this morning, I was still, still doing virtual mass at home, but it's just about every day. And I, I couldn't recollect when I'd heard Mary mentioned. And that was just something that dawned on me because I'm probably a bit more aware now. So there's something about our whole church that extols Mary, but maybe finds it hard in some ways to bring her forward as, as a model. Except maybe at Christmas when we all react to the crib and, you know, and yes. Mary and the baby Jesus. And that has a huge impact, um, that maternal, familial scene and our kids love it, that kind of thing. But then to me, that sort of fades very fast. So I think it's unfair to Mary, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, and so your idea of um, inspiring a, a more Marian devotion, uh, you know, I, I, and not necessarily in an awfully pious sense the way I think it used to be, but in a much more aware sense of how she was acted, you know, and does that still influence us today? Can it influence us today? Or rather, can it help us today, perhaps, is a, a better choice of words. Yeah, so I just want to take a few minutes. There's a couple of comments here. Um, someone saying, you know, fam family dynamics have really changed, pressure with so many single moms and issues with their kids. Um, sure. And then uh, someone says, too, that Oh, it seems so funny because my mother's far away. I kind of try to prove that I can do it without her. A Shannon here says something beautiful. I had a priest tell me I should try to pray a rosary each day and even if a decade at a time to think of how Mary had gone through all that we do as moms, crying baby, nursing, waking up. Uh, you got to give that, I was going to say give that priest a hug, but I guess you better not during COVID. <laughs> um, so uh, Liz Garcia, my pastor at St. Dominic's, always refers to Mother Mary, which <laughs> is fantastic. And, you know, one of the purposes of our ministry also is to remind mothers to take our Blessed Mother on as their mother, you know, that you've got right. a powerhouse of grace there available to you. Our Blessed Mother wants to help you raise your children. So, Moira, I'd love to hear your your reflection on uh, Mary, the model of motherhood. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and Dorothy, let me know if you want me to, you know, keep quiet. Um, you know, if, <laughs> if, 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 if it goes on too long, <laughs> you know, because um, with the, no, I know, I know you will if I if okay. I overdo it. So anyway, thank you. I'm I'm really. I was really happy a couple of years ago to be asked to give a talk on this topic, Mary, Mother of God, because it made me reflect um, on Mary as mother. As I said, you know, it, it didn't, this idea didn't come spontaneously to me when I was younger. I had a certain awareness, and even although I'm named after, Moira actually means Mary, so my name is Mary Mary, which is just crazy when you think about it. Um, I always say, Probably Our Lady thought I needed a double dose. <laughs> I finally got the message. I was slow to appreciate her. It's just one of those, those things. So, but it's a topic that now is really dear to my heart. So let's see how let's see how this goes. And I just want to start by thanking Dorothy for asking me to come and come and do this virtually today. So a couple of years ago, Pope Francis actually said uh, that the, the first day of the year is the solemnity of the Blessed Virgin, Mother of God. It's really wonderful that she's right in the very first day of the year. 
And he said then in his homily that having a devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary isn't just something that's nice or pious or even just a devotion. He said it's actually an obligation in the life of us Catholics, as Catholic Christians. So he said it's not just spiritual etiquette, he called it a requirement of the Christian life. So he was putting it already at a slightly higher level than I think many of us would have thought once before. And of course, Pope Francis is very pro-women in so many of the things he's written and he said. He said this too, that the gift of the mother, meaning Mary, but the gift of every mother and every woman is most precious for the church, for she too, Mary, and the church, they're both mother and women, the way the church often refers to itself, as you know, as she, the bride of Christ. So there's a theological uh, affirmation to this, and it's a very positive affirmation about women, because the Pope, I think, is really moving on this particular dynamic. He also points out to us that this isn't a question of power it's not you know it's not women's rights it's not th these are other dimensions that are very important but when he's talking about us as women he's talking about service service to the church and service to the community he's we, you, we all know i think we're called to evangelize where we are and this is what he means by service i mean he's not meaning hard labor but just that that's how our attention should be directed. So it's like equal opportunities for service as it's equal opportunities for women. And he mentioned then that all of us need a mother's heart. And this word heart comes out several times, especially when we're talking about Mary. And the Pope says, the mother's heart is one which knows how to keep the tender love of God and to feel the heartbeat of everyone around us. So that internal experience of the love of God, which in, again, in our Catholic way of doing things, we, as Cardinal Collins is always saying, we gather together to be sent out. We gather together to be nourished because we need that, but then we, we sent out to nourish others. And so that idea of feeling the heartbeat of all around us means we're going to be sensitive, aware of other people's needs too. And that's a form of service. So it's so important, um, this idea of, of Mary. We know that faith, so it's not just devotion uh, in a, the pious sense, although that's very much part of it. But knowing more about Mary is, is a faith stance. And so he actually says, but don't go too far with doctrine. You know, the sort of way sometimes we do in theology school, we're analyzing everything and that's the task that has to be done and it's important. It isn't necessarily essential for everybody, which is then a different matter. His concern about many matters actually, uh, this is Pope Francis I mean, is that too much attention to doctrine can make us legalistic instead of being loving and experiencing our faith in a very spontaneous way. So you remember the parable about Jesus and the Sabbath and healing and how the law said, no, no, you can't heal on the Sabbath, that's not allowed, and Jesus uh, healed the man. And then said, what's more important, the keeping of the Sabbath or looking after our neighbor? So again, thank God he talked in parables, so we all know what he means, uh, even if we have to think pretty hard sometimes about what it does mean but the point is always made by him. Moira, can I just- Of I just course. One little comment. Um, there's a mom here that's saying um, that many young moms don't have a good relationship with their own mothers. And because they don't have a good relationship with their own mother, you know, they don't want to ask her for help. And it kind of is a block between yeah. their relationship with our blessed mother. And I, I just wanted to say to those mothers, I beg you to remember that our Blessed Mother is a perfect mother, the mother that you're looking for that your mother couldn't be. I know that I struggled. I had, I had struggles with my own mother for a variety of different reasons. And someone finally said to me, give your mother a break and take Mother Mary on as your mother. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and it hit me like a ton of bricks and it was when I began my consecration. 
So I don't want you there sitting at home thinking that you can't connect with our Blessed Mother because of your mother. In fact, you need our Blessed Mother more. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna ask you, sorry now to continue more with your reflection. No, no, it's, it's a good point. And I'm glad um, the, the listener brought it, brought it up because that's exactly the sort of uh, event that maybe prevents a lot of us in our faith life in general from somehow moving on or progressing whatever terminology we want to use. It may be our mother, it may be our father. You know, I mean, family relations are very often not as, perfect they're never perfect but even you know they're never always that good and we all know that uh, parents can actually damage sometimes their their children very much those are the sorts of situations i actually think myself uh, that need professional help you know pastoral help as well and thank god that's available if people are brave enough if you like to seek it because having uh you know relationships that are not that wonderful I think is a block for all of us. I think many of us, as we go through life, we find that uh, one of the most important things that helps us develop, and even spiritually as well as emotionally, is to try and heal those relationships which are healable and learn to deal with them when they are not, because they sometimes don't always work out to a very happy end, it's true. Mm -hmm. And so this this uh, Dorothy's uh, idea that we need Mary more, or spiritual help, in really in, in any form, I think is, is vital uh, because that's such an important dimension for us. And it's very often in those areas that we get the strength, you know, through maybe spiritual counseling or spiritual direction to help deal with the gaps in our lives that we would really like to see healed, however it takes. So no, those, those, those are really good points. So I, I'm not sort of working on the basis that I or MJ else has either the perfect family or the perfect relationship with Mary, or even the perfect relationship with my church. But, uh, you know, I've reached the stage where I know the important thing is, is to acknowledge the goodness and to try and build on that and to try and deal with any areas, because so many areas actually can be helped. Yeah. So that's a very individual thing, but it's important for people, sure. So I, I, I'm sorry that I interrupted your reflection because it was so beautiful, but so please continue. Okay, I'll go on with, with this. So, <laughs> um, what is, what, using that word heart is something we know that, that they often say about Mary in scriptures, that Mary heard all these wonderful things, you know, the appearance of the angel Gabriel, and said yes to the angel and was told that at some point she would conceive through the Holy Spirit. And later on, we hear, you know, Mary really didn't understand all these things. So it wasn't necessarily a head thing. It's almost too much to get a head around, but that she pondered them in her heart. And so it's so important, I think, that for us, not in her mind, not, not that endless going over and over, but a sort of heart storage. It's a theological point. It's rational. But what happened to Mary isn't really subject to proof and evidence, you know, as in factual matters. And that's very often something that happens to us in the spiritual life as well. But when Mary gave birth, I mean, she gave birth to a child in the normal way, as we know, and to a baby who was normal. And when I use that word, I just mean like all the rest of our children. Uh, when he, in this case, was born. I mean, as Dorothy said too, of course he was hungry and she had to breastfeed. They didn't really have much else in those days. Um, he needed to be changed. He did went through all the sort of normal procedures in the growing up that all of her children do. You know, she would have to make clothes, find clothes, who knows? We think we've got it bad sometimes, but you know, you don't just go down to the store and buy things. Everything would be handmade and all that sort of thing. The amount of work that would go on in women's lives in those days, as we know, a very different kind of work, but work nonetheless, and very time consuming. I always think it's interesting uh, if I look at you know, paintings and museums of Mary and Jesus, and Mary is always, nearly always, holding the baby towards us. She's always in the background. It's all about the child. You know, we don't see too many statues or paintings of Mary sort of nuzzling the kid's head or giving him a kiss on the cheek or anything like that. I'm sure she did that, but it's not the way it's portrayed for us. It's this idea that she knew 
that this was a special child and the, the focus was always, always on him. Of course, he transcended what we would call ordinary categories and questions, and she would be experiencing it at a very different level. I know that many of us in reading our children are mystified at times about what's going on in the child's life because we can't read minds. Um, just as they're sometimes mystified by us, and we all go through, well, not all, I shouldn't generalize, but many of us anyway go through periods of pull and push and upset and somebody used the word family dynamics there, always moving, you know, that's the word, dynamics means that. There's a constant change, a constant development, both in the parent and the child. So we're never the same, you know, 20 years on than we were 20 years before. And all that's constantly being filtered in. When Jesus actually, I mean, since there's nothing in scripture about where he went out to play or who he played with or anything like that, we don't know anything really about his uh, apparent childhood apart from the time when he was presented in the temple and when he was found, in the when he got lost really, and he was then found in the temple. But until then, up until, I mean, he stayed at home till he was 30, which in those days would be quite old, you know. Um, 30 is very young these days, and it is young. But in those days, 30, you know, you've been well past marrying time. Uh, people estimate that Mary herself was possibly 14, 15, because that was the age that young girls got married, because life expectancy was, you know, much, much lower. So all that kind of thing. People in the village in Nazareth must have been asking questions. Are you ever going to get married, you know? Or Mary, doesn't look like you're going to have any grandchildren, you know, the sorts of things. Somebody said that to me once about her eldest son who happens not to be married. <laughs> and so, you know, and you just think, well, it's his business, you know. But it's pe people have the most amazing questions for people. And she must have undergone that kind of scrutiny as well. So he was 30 when he finally set out on his what's called his public mission, his whole evangelical thrust, and how she must have worried and wondered then. I mean, how could she have understood what he was about? If one of our sons claimed the authority that Jesus did on so many occasions, I think we'd be a little concerned. You know, who is <laughs> Do you know what you're doing, <laughs> etc. You know, I mean, this would be a very human about this. Aren't you being a little harsh on some people? You know, throwing straight in. It's a, a scene I love when he's striding through the temple and kicking over the money changers tables, showing that there's such a thing as justifiable anger at some situations. We're not supposed to put up with things that are unjust. We're just not supposed to get angry about things that don't deserve to be angry about, if you can understand that. And she would be thinking, I'm your mother and you should listen. But Mary was clearly different because I don't know if you know this, but something I found really uh, strange was that in all of our scriptures, Mary is recorded as speaking only four times. Mm. It's really, considering how we women usually are about talking, it's, uh, it's really quite striking. And I have to feel there's there's a lesson in that too. There's there's something in there. So the first time she spoke was at the Annunciation. We know that. Um, and what she says in response to the angel Gabriel is instantly, uh, behold the handmaid of the Lord. You know, not even who are you and why are you bothering me, but that openness, which is dramatic to the first thing she says as well, whatever the Lord is asking me, yes, I will do it. So we talk about Mary said yes, and she did. And it was very uncoerced and sp spontaneous. <clears throat> so she was clearly open to life in the most profound sense, which is, to my way of thinking, not quite the way many of us react these days uh, in society in general. Uh, when people think of something like pregnancy very often as a burden, you know, something that will keep me back, something I didn't want, so all, all the different ways that people react. So that didn't seem to be at all the manifestation from her in that sense. And right after that, when she actually did become pregnant, because we don't really understand the time frame, 
we know that she went to meet her cousin Elizabeth, who of course sort of greeted her and told her that the child in her, Elizabeth's womb, had jumped for joy because here was the mother of her God. It was in scripture, it's very often, as we know, put like that, that Elizabeth, in a sense, realized that this was something very special. And of course, Mary was delighted to be there helping her cousin, that bit about service. But then we're told in scripture that she said it, she, her response is called the Magnificat. And it's, to my mind, one of the strongest prayers in scripture. And the fact that it comes from a woman is, makes it to me, even doubly stronger. So just, I know you know it, but I'm just going to read it fairly quickly. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, because he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations will call me blessed, because he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is from generation to generation for those who fear him. He has shown might with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the conceit of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their throne and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has given help to Israel, his servant, mindful of his mercy, even as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. So we think this is just a little young girl, and she was from a very small village, well trained in the Jewish scriptures, and some of them are actually alluded to in the verses that she spoke, because that's what they would do. They would use things that were known to make sure that their listeners actually understood it. But she is able to say um, he has cast down the mighty from their thrones. I mean, it's highly political. It's highly social. It's much more uh, political and social, I would suggest, even than spiritual, except that it is also spiritual. And I'm going to come back to that later. But I just wanted to talk, you know, read it rather just now because it's so important. This was the second thing that Mary is recorded as having said. And on the third occasion was when Jesus disappeared when the family was in Jerusalem. They were visiting Jerusalem and they discovered he was missing as they returned home. I always think the scripture is very interesting because they were already separated. So Jesus was being looked after, they thought, by somebody else while they were somewhere at the front of the caravan on the way back to Nazareth. And it wasn't until the next day they discovered he was missing. That's something that would be totally foreign to most of us. Uh, you know, if, if and, and fair enough, these days it's completely different too. That nuclear family, the whole village takes a village to raise a child thing, is something that we just don't really experience. But when they did catch what, up with him, he was, uh, you know, she was worried naturally and, and then said to him, you know, why have you treated your father and myself like this? In other words, you know, if you do this to us, this is really wrong. A very human response. And he sort of tells him quite coolly, I think, uh, I don't know why you were worried. I, mean, I had to be about my father's business. The interesting thing is, there isn't anything else in scripture that says that maybe said anything else at that point, except that again, she pondered this in her heart. This is somebody really different. And at the nativity for Mary again, Mary is not mentioned as speaking. The focus again is all on the child. So, I mean, I think that's interesting because the nativity, nativity is something that, as I mentioned earlier, is very important for most of us in terms of uh, family and representational of, of caring, but nothing is said. We're left to conclude that the important thing about the nativity is clearly the child, the child who's going to become who eventually becomes. By now she was beginning, by the time of the, uh, in the temple, finding him in the temple, I think she must have been beginning to realize that this really is the son of God, because children of 12 don't talk like that, nor are they trained even to speak in the temple the way he actually did. So she did, again, keep the, these things in her heart. And quite frankly, I think if she talked about it, I don't think many people would have believed her. 
it's such an incredible story when we think about it, incredible history. So she's called the seed of wisdom and she's called all sorts of things, but she is definitely full of grace, as we say in the Hail Mary and as the angel proclaimed at the Annunciation. And she was able to let, this is where I think she's important, really important for us because there's a danger, I think, of thinking here that she's, she too is on that really transcendent scale where we can't relate to her and she doesn't relate to us. And I think that's not correct. I think the very fact that she was silent in many ways is actually a good thing. In this particular context, it isn't always good to be silent and I don't mean that. But she is, has a spotlight shining on Jesus and what he does. And she is able to let that grace build on her own human nature. So the, the human parts that come out then would be concern and lack of trust and agonizing over the fate of this young man at that point. But in scripture after that, we don't hear anything at all about doubts or concerns or worries. I'm not saying that didn't happen. We just don't actually hear about them. That idea of pondering in her heart is that idea of silent trusting um, that all will be well. Uh, and again, just as she had said at the Annunciation, how could she possibly really have understood why would God choose me um, to bear the Son of God? And she kept it to herself. She pondered it in her heart. And later on, she did the same thing. But she was always supportive. We know she was there at the foot of the cross. We know she was with him several other times. It's mentioned in scripture and, and one more that I still have to mention. But she was there and supportive, but in that sort of silent strength, the type of silence that is a strong silence. It's not a weak or cowardly or backing down or non-confrontational. So courage and strength, perseverance, and to my mind, above all, trust that that he would fulfill the will of God. She had said she would fulfill the will of God and she continues to do this. It's amazing perseverance. Actually, Pope Francis talks at one point about what we can actually Pope that although I said earlier I haven't heard many homilies that mention Mary and I'm so happy to hear that some people have. It may just have been my particular setting. The homilies have been great, it just so happens Mary hasn't been part of the actual homily. Lots yeah. of prayers afterwards and things especially the rosary. But Pope Francis in, uh, I think, talk, thinking about women and, and some people call it the feminine genius. I, I just think it's the sort of the, the, the feminine gift just of being women, all of us. So it's, it's, we all have it. But what we learn from that silence is that we too have to keep our, our own kind of silence, to keep our souls free from, uh, he calls it being corroded by consumerism. He calls it the blare of commercials, the stream of empty words, and the overpowering waves of empty chatter and loud shouting. Moira, can I just pause for one second? Mm -hmm. um, this is very, very powerful reflection. Um, you know, even for me personally, I'm, I'm sure it is for you know everyone here. And uh, I was talking to a dear friend of mine yesterday, and I said, you know. I think I've been, you know, like, is it possible that one's life has become too full and that this pandemic is a time to ponder, right? Because I, I think as a culture and as mothers, you know, like we're rushing about here and there and we're taking our children to hockey and taking them here and going on this trip because we can and going to this mall because we can and doing this because we can and doing that because we can and then we're missing something even though we're blessed so much and i was just having this conversation yesterday with a dear friend of mine karen and and, and, and like, I was saying to her, like, I am guilty now when I look at it. I've been stuffing so much into my life, and just stuff and stuff. And it's good stuff, you know, <laughs> trying to start more mother's groups, trying to read more spiritual <laughs> books, trying to go to more. But at the same yeah. time, the, the pondering has been kind of knocked out of me a little. <laughs> um, and, and so I, 
so I love the, I, I love this focus on the importance of pondering in our hearts and the importance of you know I think this generation of women you know me included and this next generation you know I used to deliver courses on how to be assertive and how to communicate effectively mm -hmm. and how to get your point across that you're heard you know and how to deal with difficult people and and I'm like, shut up Dorothy right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know having been in the corporate world for so long you know like I I was so excited that I learned how to negotiate and but there's something mystical about the woman that has been lost and 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 so I'm really really enjoying your reflection so I'll ask you to continue <laughs> no it's 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 true I mean and I've I've been there yeah when you say hockey you know five sons you can imagine and we're they're a very a fabulous bunch I mean I have to say that in case everybody's listening no they actually were a fabulous bunch uh, but we were very active because my husband and I are both very active types and you know, if you have a big small family big family and for goodness sake you want your kids to participate and do yeah, things, yeah, 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 all yeah. These things and so you're running 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 um, and it's true you are you are running 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 there's no get I mean we could opt out and say okay we're, we're not going to do any of that but that's unrealistic for most yeah no you would like to see your kids participate if you can do it and if they can do it you know whatever form it takes yes. yeah that's so important in life and I you know so I mean it's it's much easier for me not so much to be saying things like this it's always easy to say things but it's the doing of things that's the the, the real the real test and and so you know since I don't have them all around me the whole time anymore and all that sort of thing um, it's it's a lot easier but even, you know, I remember when I went back to school to do theology and I, my sixth one had just started kindergarten. So that's when I, I went back and, you know, and I loved having that study time. Oh my gosh, all that quiet time just for me, you know, I'm yeah. studying. It wasn't leisure, but it felt like leisure. <laughs> and it was, it was so important. But I, I know, um, I think finding, it doesn't need to be long, you know, that, that sort of, time to listen and the, the whole point i think about really listening in spiritual terms anyway is you have to be quiet <laughs> there has to be silence you know all those stories about elisha and the storm you know the lightning no god's voice wasn't the lightning no god's voice wasn't in the storm no no wasn't in the tornado but then there was a little gentle breeze and there was god's voice you know and it really, it, all those sorts of uh, approaches really hit me because it's just so important for our internal development. And, and I think, you know, finding 15 minutes to read a couple of passages of scripture, for example, whatever it is, I mean, everybody's taste and, is different. There's millions of things, spiritual books, things on, 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 online, all that kind of thing. Just a very short time, um, I think it works wonders for the for the soul and to keep that balance because very often I used to find myself because I would always be running and I'd always manage physical things and I would always get dinner on the table and all that sort of stuff what would go the spiritual side you even talk to many priests and people and they will say things like uh, when they're busy 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 and they are what's the first thing to go the spiritual side you know so this is a very common reaction, you know, because we just don't make time for it. And, uh, and and I think at a certain time of our life, we maybe don't have time for much, but I just think it's something to keep in mind as, a, as an ongoing thing. Because I found, used to find even when I was really caught up in family life and, you know, everything going on around about me, uh, the, we were always sort of Sunday Catholics, you know, we were always at mass, the kids, you know, we did everything like that, but I would say nothing much over and above. But, uh, oh no, that's true, that's not true. I was running a pro-life group in heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've got a bio here. That, <laughs> but you know, it was the doing things, the doing things. You can do, 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 and it's good, and it's service. I mean, and I think it's great when people do things, I really do. But it's that other question again of keeping, you know, the Mary thing, what's the focus? Is the focus on my doing something, or is the focus on, where are we going with this? Where is the, you know, the family dynamics? Is this affecting the family? How, blah, blah. 
Um, we all have very different reactions to that, but I think keeping that silence part is uh, you don't have to go away on a retreat, you know, to get most of, I could never do that. Leave the family and loved it when people said, I'm going away for a weekend retreat. Which <laughs> 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 yeah. I could, you know. Yeah. Um, but you don't really need that. It's great if you can, but you can do it yourself too. Because it really is, but, you know, as they say in scripture, you just go into your room and you lock the door, or the bathroom door, or whatever it is. Whatever. You, so let, let's go back to what right. uh, Pope right. uh, right. 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 Uh, Father was saying. Okay, no. All right, so just uh, on, on that silence bit, actually, um, that idea again is where the heart comes in because we're, when we're really listening in that sense, being open to God is really what it means, then that's when the, the heart hears the words or is at least open to just what is there for us because it's always there for us, di direct from the, the top, if you like. So uh, Pope Francis talks about the Magnificat too at one point, and he says that both Mary and Jesus are very similar, that they both talk about lowliness. And by lowliness, they really mean that they don't have any pride, that pride is, you know, the wrong kind of pride. There's an okay pride, and then we all know what the wrong kind of pride is, misplaced pride. They lived in really pretty poor situations, um, which is a big lesson for us in our consumer society. I mean, nobody suggests and we all run away and live in, you know, little makeshift villages. That's not really the point, but it's that constant reminder that it's not about things. It's not even about houses. It's not about possessions. That's, that wasn't it at all in Jesus' message. And again, that's the whole idea, I think, of uh, even the crib scene that touches us so much the rea you know, a nice little crib scene outside our churches is beautiful, but the reality was a cold stable with nothing but animals and no mother or doctor or midwife or doula or anything like that. Or to... a girl. <laughs> there you go. I mean, and it wasn't cringing acceptance of a bad fate. It looked like, you know, real acceptance. I think that's, to me, that's the heart of the Magnificat. And the Magnificat to me is, is, the, is the, the major... Uh, message I take from thinking about Mary that she has no pride. She calls herself this lowly handmaid, although she's been so honored and she knows that at a certain level anyway she does. She embraces this poverty because the will of God is absolutely everything to her. I mean to strike down the mighty from their thrones and the rich she has sent empty away. I mean that's quoting from the Old Testament but she means it too, and she knows what she means. It's not vindictive. It's not like, uh, you know, you guys are gone and now we will be the winners. It's not like that. She was able to see it because she was a visionary. She could actually see God's ways. Um, and as the mother of God, and our mother, she points us in the same ways. She's the mother of the way. You know, the Magnificat, when you read it then in those terms, it doesn't sound too maternal, you know. Um, not in the sense of sometimes when we think of Mary as mother holding infant Jesus. But as I said, things change, the child changes, the parent changes too, the situation changes. So we're, she developed as well, although she was pregnant when she was saying it. But she's telling us there's many ways of being motherly. You know, there's, there's no one way of being maternal. What especially it sounds here, I think, is that Mary is speaking to the world. I mean, she's speaking to us as her children. This, we talk about women's voices these days, you know, the, the idea that we should have our voice and we do have a voice and it's wonderful if our voices are heard and we have to encourage people to have their voice in the correct sort of way. It's not even so much a right as I think it's a, something that's inherent in every human because our Catholic Church teaches us that every single person has human dignity. So every single right. person I just has... To Oh, I, I, yeah. My um I, I need to plug in my computer, so just forgive me. <laughs> you can continue. So I just before you before it all collapses or something. I, I promised myself I would remember to plug it in. Okay, and, uh, you go ahead. And, right. so, <laughs> and I'm sure gonna be finished, so you know it's not hold on everybody. I hope you're okay with this. I feel as if I've been talking for a long time. Anyway, I do think that um we have to pay attention to God's way. This is Mary telling us because that's what she did. 
in the, in the sense that he that is mighty has done great things for me. She was truly grateful and truly appreciative. And so really should we be for, for our children as well. Uh, and she's telling us that, I think. She recognizes that God is using her as a messenger. She is a messenger. She's really important in her own right, and our church venerates her in that sense. But she's a messenger just as the angel who spoke to her was a messenger, and she willingly consented, just as she consented to being the mother of the Word incarnate. Right? So really it's pointing the way, I think, to the way we should be in, in the world. It's a, it really is God, loving God and loving your neighbor in the Magnificat but more spoken in terms of a prophecy as much as anything else. It's really, I think, to me, a, a call to conversion. So um, there's a bit I'm not going to deal with, Dorothy, because I think it maybe gets a little bit too technical. So, um, so Mary, the other area where Mary is really important then as messenger is also as intercessor, and that's how she's most often sort of used, if you like, in Catholic teaching. She is the way to Jesus. She is the way to the Lord. So we very often sort of pray indirectly uh, through Mary to Jesus. So she intercedes aware that as a mother that she can, indeed she must make present to the Son the needs of people, especially the weakest and most disadvantaged. And that's why when I'm sending out um, material from our, my Bioethics Institute, I often will sign it, Our Lady Help of the Sick, pray for us. You know, we, 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 oft, we, very pray, we often pray to Mary for the well-being of people, um, and we're asking her to ask her son as well, but we're praying to Mary, because the Pope, as you know, when he comes back from a trip, goes to Santa Maria Maggiore Church in, in Rome, St. Mary Major, and thanks the Virgin, um, uh, the, the Mary, uh, health of the Roman people, saviour of the Roman people, Salus Populi Romani. And so he, again, is someone who's very taken, I think, with this Marian devotion. I think it's going to have some kind of impact. Now, there was a fourth time that Mary spoke, and you probably thought I'd forgotten about the fourth one, right? Um, but, of course, she spoke at the marriage feast at Cana. And I guess there's a message for us here, too. Because she says to her son, they have no wine. And he more or less says, well, that's not my problem. You know, it's <laughs> not my party. <laughs> they should have thought of that. It's as if he's not too bothered. The way it's worded in scripture, even, it's quite fascinating to me as a family dynamic. That he doesn't just say straight away, okay, mom, I'll see to it. You know, it's kind of... Hmm. You know, <laughs> I thought that was a very natural part of scripture. The more natural it is, sometimes the more credible it is too. I think that's maybe right. But in fact, he did do what his mother asked. And it's interesting to me what she tells the servers. She just says simply to them, do as he tells you. And of course that applies to us. And at that point, he did do what she asked him, not so much told him. So revealing her power as mother of God and also as an intercessor for us to her son, who is God the son. So, so many of these stories in scripture serve to reinforce that idea of uh, the, the, the role of Mary, the power of Mary, and uh, also that there is that way to her son, the power, the power of prayer and intercession. So do whatever he tells you. And the last words we actually hear from Mary in scripture, we see her, at Calvary, at the foot of the cross, and we hear Jesus saying to her, to, you know, this to John, this is your mother, and this is your son. And we presume from then on that John is sort of going to take care of Mary. She's there at the resurrection, but she's not in the forefront. Mary Magdalene gets that, you know, um, spotlight, if you like. So even there, she's, a, she's definitely there, supportive and presumably happy, <laughs> but we don't really hear about her, but we can, we can presume. Because now, again, the focus is on the son. The son is just as he was when he was a baby. Her focus is to sort of be behind the son, supporting him, pushing him out towards the rest of us in, or in you know, humanity in general. So that underlying humility to me, genuine humility, kind of knowing your place, and also putting the spotlight where it should be is an incredibly generous way to be. And it's very often, sometimes it's very hard to do. 
So she was a loving mother, a sorrowful mother at many times, but a blessed mother. And she says that herself in the Magnificat, behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. So that idea of, um, you know, you, you have to go through trials, it's an inevitable, there's of course an extreme, but even in everyday life, there are these different trials, always, everybody has them in some form and another, some a lot more severe than others, and we, we recognize them. But is that her constant sort of pushing us forward with the sun for, to guide us in the ways of the sun and towards the sun? Uh, she knows that is the best way for us too. And so she knew that as she herself would be henceforth called blessed, we ourselves, if we follow her way, will not be venerated in the same way as blessed, but we will, we will be blessed. And that's why we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Okay, Dorothy, it's all yours. <laughs> um, there, there, there have just been so many graces dispensed. My, my heart and my head are kind of bursting here. <laughs> um, in, in, a, in a good, in a, in a, in a good way, you know. Um, so. <laughs> no, like because you know, my head is bursting. That can, I guess, that can sound. Uh, I mean it in a beautiful way. I, 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 many things have struck me, but the the one thing that is kind of like the double strike is you know this whole idea that Jesus listened to his mother. Right? She asked something, mm -hmm. and he did it. And how many of us now have had the experience that we're asking our children to do this, that, and the other? And um, I kind of personally feel like there's been a loss of the power of motherhood. Um, and part of our hope as a, a ministry is to revive that power and to revive that kind of authority that comes with being a mother. Um, I think that some children have kind of stopped listening to their mothers or stopped revering their mothers or stopped uh, paying their mother homage for, for a lot of different reasons. And, um, and, and and so your 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 reflection kind of you know reminded me that as mothers we deserve to be listened to, but might we pray about why and how we lost the office of motherhood in North America or this current climate? Right. There's something. And I remember once being at a mother's group meeting and a wo woman said, I, you know, I never really struck me that motherhood was a vocation. I just saw it as a series of tasks. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I have a deep conviction and it's not based on any theological training whatsoever. Um, but that when our, a child is born, that each mother is given a deposit of grace specific to that child. And that's a gift that's given to her when she gives birth. And you can either access those graces or dismiss them because you're so busy, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, because you haven't pondered and prayed enough you know, and that our authority, I don't know, like you're the theologian, I'm just Dorothy Polarski from my kitchen, right? <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I don't know, but would you agree that there's been kind of like a loss of, you know, like, because in the past there was this, this thing that it's your mother and because it's your mother, you honor her. And even if she drives you crazy, you still visit her on, Mother's Day, and even if she's, you know, like that there was a just, you know, I don't know, at least I was raised in such a way, and 
I just wouldn't dream of, so this is my mother, this is my mother, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And have we lost that, do you think, as a culture? Or we haven't lost it and it's just my crazy thinking? No, 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 I think you're hitting on something. I mean, I think some people have. I, I think that's true, I do. But I see it, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of um, people who handle it really well, you know? Um, I mean, the, the being the mother part, the, as apart from the physically giving birth, but the yeah. role of the mother, because, uh, you know, a lot of the people, I mean, of course, generalize, I don't want to, but the, so many times if I've been at schools, mostly for grandchildren things now, right? Their soccer games or their hockey games and all that. So now here the, the circle or the cycle has been going on for quite some time. <laughs> you know, into their spillovers and things. And there's an awful lot of mothers that seem to be coping really well. And I mean by that, the way they actually handle their children. Mm -hmm. And they, um, you know, they're, they, a lot of them, they don't take what I call any guff from them. I mean, you know, you have to, your word authority is a really interesting one, you know, because I mean, I, I'm not a subscriber to the idea that you can be really best buddies with your kids when they're really young. I mean, you're, you're their, obviously not unfriendly with them, I don't mean that either, but you're the parent, you're the mother, um, you're the one that sets the, the tone, you're the, you know, that kind of thing. It's not always easy, mm -hmm. uh, and depending on the kids again, of course, you know, and, and so, I mean, I had my share of learning experiences as well. By the time I got to number seven, I think I was a little bit better at it than I was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, I, think, yeah, I think it should be, because yeah, we're not, this is the point, Dorothy, we're not trained to be parents. We're not trained to be married either. It always amazes me that we spend so much time in school for this, that, and the other thing. But you know, you get four weeks marriage preparation or whatever. Um, and you, unless you grew up in a big family where you had a lot of experience of kids, you really don't, you know. So anyway, I have a lot of sympathy for uh, for for mothers in general. Uh, raising kids is actually very difficult. You know, raising kids <laughs> yeah. well. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yes. being married yeah. <laughs> time consuming yes and and you really have to give up so much of yourself i mean you really you oh really, yes really do, don't you i mean i don't think you can do it otherwise and i don't mean that in a self-sacrificial way i'm you know not in a martyr sense it's all for my kids i don't mean that but i think what people have lost sometimes is the long view you know that okay, those first three or four or five years can seem interminable, depending on what's going on in your household. But, you know, it's the old story. Once you're older, whoop, it's gone, it's gone. Whoop, you know, puff of smoke and you say, oh, I wish I could do it all. No, well, maybe I don't wish I could do it all over again. But, you know, you really, you really see that it's actually quite fast. And so the re you have the rest of your life to be you <laughs> um, and still be in relation with kids. So the, when they're really young, I, I, I wish some, I don't like seeing kids who are being overly indulged, you know, they get too many things. Uh, it's about things and toys and um, stuffies and goodness knows what, um, you know, when those, those, they're not wrong, they're not wrong, but they're not the essentials, you know, they, they really just need the person, they really do. And so if, if anything has changed, I, I wonder sometimes, it's not even so much that people are, I know we probably are running around with our kids that I did a lot more than my mother did, you know, you yeah, should uh -huh. did that, blah, blah. Uh, very, very different, it's a different world. You can't let them do it now. <laughs> so we have those constraints that in most places, the, you know, the, the kids can't have the freedom as young in age, they do, they do have to be looked after in that sense longer. So that's another imposition in a sense on, on families because of, you know, bad apples in the rest of society. So I think all that's difficult, but I, I do sometimes think, you know, when you're in restaurants and things, just take that kid out, would you, and just, take him outside that door and give him a talking to, you know, <laughs> instead of letting him sit there, you know, disturbing the whole, you know, that idea of yes. uh, other, other people don't count, you know, um, you know, it's all about just how I'm doing with my, my little one, that kind of thing. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm away on another train of thought here, I think, sorry. No, 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 and I, I sometimes go nuts when I, you know, like I, 
I probably spend too much time on Facebook sometimes, but like just all of a gentle parenting, right? It's like, there's nothing wrong with being gentle, but, no. but sometimes, you know, a, a child is just being completely ridiculous and they, and they need to be brought to their senses. Um, yeah. The, the, the other thing too that one of the moms mentioned here in the chat, because there's a, a lot of comments. Oh here. yeah, I couldn't read them while I was talking. Yeah. Oh my gosh, um, there's a lot. Uh, but, but someone said that, um, that, you know, that it is kind of known that, our, that, that, that Christ and God do not, they will answer every one of our blessed mother's prayers or requests that, you know, Jesus can't say no to Mary. And, and so again, I don't know whether this is, this is just Dorothy Polarski thinking it's not at all related to any theological whatever. So please correct me. But the other thing that I have a very strong conviction that if you do want to stay at home for a period of, you know, let's say, you know, three to five years with your children when they're first born. I always say, you know, there's something wrong with the world if a, a child can't depend on its mother for the first five or six years, you know. But uh, uh, one thing that I have a very strong conviction of is that if you beg our Blessed Mother and you say to our Blessed Mother, I want to watch my son. Please help me figure out a way so that I can either work from home or I can stay from home or I can, or just some kind of miracle to bless my husband's work or something. I can't think of a woman that has prayed dearly and passionately and beggingly to our Blessed Mother to watch her own children that she's able to say no to that prayer. <laughs> and, and that's, again, that's not based on any theology. Yeah. That's just based on, um, I don't know. Yeah, you know, no, my... sort of, it, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable to think that way. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's not gonna appear in the catechism or anything, right? But, uh, I mean, it's, it's true. If, if, I think if we really, want to do something that is actually going to be a good for us and for other people and we pray about it i think it's true that very often we find a way you know um and but it usually means giving up quite a lot yeah. of, and most often financial but in other situations it's uh progress in your career and all those kinds of things uh and and, and i know because i did it myself um, and at the beginning, it was actually quite hard. It wasn't financial. My husband was okay, so I really honestly couldn't say that there was no reason that I couldn't stay home. But, and I didn't at the very beginning either myself because I was articling when I had my first kid mm -hmm. and was just about to finish articling when I had the second one. And I thought, I better get the articling out of the way, you know, because of yes. blah, blah, blah. Yes. So, but I, you know, by the time the third kid was born, you no, know, I was going to stay home. I didn't know I was going to have the number that I did, of course. But um, so I thought it was just going to be a couple of years. Well, it morphed into a bit longer than a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, that's when I started to take the long view. You know, uh -huh. that um, well, I'm not exactly going to be dead when they're all in school. So I'm, you know, if if this is the right thing to do, I think it will work out in the end. So. And I think we can all maybe only speak individually about that, you know. So no, it's you're 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 uh, you're 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 well. That's what I love having you about on, on, on our. On, on, that's why I love be, spending some time with you because, you know, sometimes I have these crazy ideas and they, uh, I don't want to incubate them in my own mind and I love flushing them out, you know. So this yeah, is right. a, a, a privilege <laughs> to speak with you. Uh, now, Moira. Have you written a paper or a booklet or something that, you know, moms could read what you've just shared with us? Is there some, have you written this out at all or? Uh, well, no, apart from banging it out in the computer, you mean? Um, no, I, I haven't, but I could. Uh, 
the, you know, as a bioethicist, the stuff I deal with is the stuff that you, in terms of writing, is the stuff you read out earlier and all that sort of thing. So, you know, um, everything to do with life and morality, you might say. So, and and so that was why when I was asked to do a talk a year or so ago for your group, I told you, well, I'd never really done that <laughs> myself. I mean, this this is it. Uh, although I had done some scripture study and things, obviously doing theology, but the the, the pulling together of Mary, no. Um, but and I maybe mentioned to you just when we were talking a day or so ago that I had just written something for a book about Mary and bioethics, which when the the lead author had contacted me, I thought, well, how on earth am I going to talk about Mary and bioethics? And he said, well, it will be a challenge for you. So I thought, okay. Um, We'll take the challenge aspect and it was really quite fascinating surprise you know this this is it i find this a lot i don't know about other people but there's areas that i think i don't think there's much written about this i don't think i'm just interested in this i don't see how that can help above the book yeah well, I, 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 I am gonna <laughs> i i am gonna ask you just if, if you can you know we could create a little you know, ebook now. You know, it's not something that we're going to do today or tomorrow. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, because I'm sure that a lot of women who attended the session today would kind of go, "Oh, yeah, I'd love to dig deeper into that." So, anyway, you know what, Moira? I just okay. realized it's three twenty. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you I always talk a lot. That's why I told you oh, at the no, beginning, no. stop me if I go on, you know. No, no, no me too, me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, me too. I, uh, I, uh, okay. I, uh, I, gosh, you know, lost track of time. I was enjoying your, your, your sharing, your reflections so much. So I am going to ask you to write a booklet that um, anyway, <laughs> no, no, no we, 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 we can we can talk. <laughs> okay, we can talk. <laughs> no, because it would be it would just be such a gift to uh, to so many mothers. I think it would be a gift to so many mothers. Oh. Um, anyway, yeah. just on the behalf of everybody here, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to um, you know you've you've spoken at a couple of our mothers groups and uh, you joined us here today and. Uh, I was I was personally very deeply touched, uh, and I could go on and on about it, but then we might be here for another hour. I personally would love that, but I want to respect everyone else's time. Uh, sure. um, so I also wanted thank to you. thank each and every one of you that joined us today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Roseanne. Thank you, Claude. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Paola. Thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you, Carmela. Thank you, Jenny. Um, again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry I can't answer all of your questions. Um, someone yes, said, I am too. Someone said, you have a yeah. part two. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That might be the answer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really sorry. I see there are lots of messages in the chat box, and so I'm sorry to everybody that you know if there are points you've raised in there that I didn't get to. You know. Well, you know what question I would love to ask that I'm not going to ask, but I'll ask, but don't answer it because maybe it could be a part <laughs> two. Is what would be some practical applications of this to mothers today, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, I'm like, okay, stop talking so much, Dorothy, you know, <laughs> and try to listen more. But um, anyway, so okay. can we have a part two? I, I think we can probably arrange a part two. Um, I'm not going to commit to when because I have to actually no, talk to Moira. <laughs> no, no, I'd be delighted. We'll leave it up to you if you can okay. work it out and your listeners are okay with it. I'd be happy to do it. Fair. Yeah, yeah, no, that would be uh, that would be beautiful. So I just want to let everybody know that we do have another um, guest next week, and we're going to be covering the topic of. Uh, uh, miscarriage, uh, stillborn, uh, grief, and adoption. So for those of you, if you know anyone that has had that experience and they need a little bit of inspiration, um, please join us. Um, 
I love each and every one of you. Uh, I pray for you uh, daily, and when I go to the Blessed Sacrament, I bring y'all with me. We do have two Masses a week being celebrated for your intentions, uh, for the Catholic Moms Group Ministry, and then we have two Catholic, two Masses being celebrated a month for all of you that be attend the Dynamic Women of Faith Conference, so you're under the umbrella of our prayers. Um, so, uh, Moira, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, you're such a treasure. You're such a gift. And you're so generous, too, you know, because, you know, like, well, you could have said, like, I'm a big shot. I don't have time for this. Oh, come on. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Cut it. I know, I'm just, I'm teasing. I was happy to do it. I know you're teasing. That's yeah, I'm, you're teasing. You're teasing. <laughs> and I, you know, I love so much going to the uh, Ord and Andy dinner and seeing you be the MC. And I'm kind of like, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for all you do for the Catholic Church. You really are a gift. Uh, thank you, Karen, for joining us. Thank you, Mary, for joining us. Thank you, Merrily. Thank you, Vettina. Wow. Um, thank you all, and hopefully we'll see you next week. And remember, we love hearing from you. If you're inspired to become a Mother's Group leader, because the Mother's Group meetings are a little bit different than this, please get in touch with us. Please follow us on Instagram. Please like us on Facebook, and if you're able, uh, if you could make a donation to our ministry, that would help too. Um, you can go to the catholicmomsgroup.com website. There's a donate button, mm -hmm. and if you can't, that's fine too. But uh, we uh, we we love hearing from you. Okay, we just love hearing from you. So pl please know that you're in our prayers, and please. Um, Get in touch with us in every which way. I'm just going to say a little bit of a closing prayer because I realized I didn't say an opening prayer. So. <laughs> oh, boy. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we know that wherever two or more are gathered in your name, that you are present. We rejoice in your presence. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for all of the graces and all of the gifts dispensed today. We lift up Moira and her family in thanksgiving um, that she's used all of her talents and gifts to serve you. And we turn to our Blessed Mother in closing, praying, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd like Moira in the future to address your group or your parish, um, we did put her contact information in the chat box there. Um, but uh, if you need to reach her, you can reach me and I can redirect you to her. Uh, but uh, please remember that we love you and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. We'll see you next week. And, Thank you very much, Moira. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. 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 God bless. God bless. Yeah. Talk soon sometime, Dorothy. Okay. So yeah, we'll talk soon.